Let's um, start the press preview now for you. That's our first look at what's on the front pages as uh, they arrive. And tonight we're joined by the journalist and author Rachel Shabby and the Telegraph's deputy comment editor Annabelle Denham. They'll be with us from now until just before midnight. Welcome to you both. Well, we're going to start with the death of Mohammed Al Fayed. Um, not many of the papers have been able to have that headline on the fr front page, but the mirror does have a, a picture of him uh, there alongside uh, Diana, Princess of Wales. Rachel, take us into to this story. Yeah, so, I mean, whenever you hear anything about Mohammed Al Fayed, who, as you say, has died uh, aged 94, there's always, it's always followed by that immediate thought, isn't it, that he outlived his son and the tragedy of that, that no parent really should should have to do that. Um, and so, you know, you sort of imagine that his life was tinged with sadness ever since that fateful day of the car crash with um, Princess Diana and his son, Dodie Fired. Um, he's been described as a colourful ca character, which I think is a, a bit of a euphemism for someone who um, whose life is surrounded by things that may be fact, may not be fact, we're not quite sure where one begins and the other ends. And also the idea that he was a thorn in the side of the establishment. I think, again, it's hard to separate out whether that's because he was a thorny character or whether he was, it was because he was an outsider who did very, very well in the UK and did well, you know, got some of the sort of assets of the UK, you know, Harrods, the Ritz, a football club, that perhaps, you know, snooty British establishment didn't think, you know, a self-made Egyptian man should have. So again, there's a, there's a blurriness around that too, I would say. And Annabelle, another word uh, used to describe him, uh, flamboyant. Yes, that's right. And I think, Rachel, you're absolutely right about that blurring of the lines between fact and fiction. I'm not sure that it, they were absolutely certain on his date of birth. I think there was some debate over how old he actually was, but certainly nine decades on this earth, and there'll be many column inches devoted to that over the coming days, his contribution to business, his relationship um, with well, his son's relationship with uh, Princess Diana, the fact that he suffered uh, one of the worst fates that a parent can, but also those repeated attempts at citizenship, um, you know, his, his failure to gain acceptance in British society and, and why that was. And I think that that's going to be, you know, in, in the history books in the future, I think there'll be so much investigation into why why it was that he had those repeated failed attempts uh, at British citizenship. Yes, and Rachel, we spoke previously to uh, Dr Tessa Dunlop, uh, the Royal Historian, and she was saying that that was something that he, he absolutely craved throughout his life, that acceptance um, from the establishment. Yeah, that's right. And I think, I think he had his citizenship re rejected twice. Twice, yeah. And I, I think I remember him getting really annoyed with Jack Straw, who's then... Home Secretary at one of the times, the late 90s, when he was denied citizenship, um, took it very personally and saw it as um, people being out to get him, whereas, you know, I think there were quite valid and concrete reasons for the citizenship being denied at Brown with cash for questions, wasn't it? Yeah, but, I mean, it's case. understandable in some ways. He obviously paid a huge amount of money uh, in tax. He made massive donations to charity, to particularly Great Ormond Street, hospital so you can understand perhaps why there was some frustration they had four British uh, uh, children so you know clearly made uh, a big contribution he turned Harrods into the epitome of Britishness so again you know we don't fully understand the reasons why he was rejected, but perhaps it's understandable there was some frustration there. Uh, and prior to the death of his son, uh, Dodie, in that car crash in, in Paris with, with Diana, um, the relationship with the, the, the royal family was, was quite different. Yeah, I mean, he was someone who actually thought quite well of the royals, as far as I can make out. He enjoyed their company um, and particularly enjoyed um, Princess Diana's company, certainly if... Uh, the series The Crown is to be believed, although, again, there's that question of where fact begins and fiction begins and fact ends. Mm. Well, uh, it's 
come in a little late to make uh, most of the, the front pages uh, aside from uh, the, the mirror. So let's take a look at some of the other front pages for you now. The Financial Times says the UK economy has defied expectations by growing by 2% according to new figures. The eye hears that ministers were told as long ago as 2019 that there were concerns about the structural integrity of schools, with hundreds still awaiting safety checks. The Mail has the headline, Hundreds More Schools at Risk. It's the same story for The Times. Their headline, When Will This School Crisis End? Ask Parents. And the Telegraph speaks to the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, who expresses her concern that uh, members of the police force are too vocal with their political opinions. There it is. Well, let's uh, take you back to uh, Rachel and Annabelle now. And we'll look at the Mail's um, front page. And this is the story about hundreds more at uh, risk concerning the schools, the safety of uh, school buildings. Annabelle. Well, I, you know, I think when this story first broke and Gillian Keegan came out and insisted that we oughtn't to uh, worry and that there were only a hundred or so schools that were going to be affected, I certainly had this sort of sinking feeling that it was going to be a much bigger story than that. And now on the front page of the Mail, uh, the suggestion that hospitals, council houses, courts, police stations, uh, leisure centres are all at risk of collapse because of this rack, this flawed uh, construction material. Um, so it could be potentially catastrophic. Parents asking when all of this is going to end. Well, it could go on for months, if not uh, years. Pupils being forced to learn in, in porter cabins, uh, you know, to mail saying that uh, schools have been putting up tented classrooms. And of course, some pupils who simply cannot go to school, it's not safe for them to do so. Um, and that's, you know, echoes of lockdown then being forced uh, back to online learning, isolated uh, from their friends, missing out on sport and all the uh, extracurricular that goes with that. Um, you know, a concern that I have is that the government is so concerned about the pressure that it is coming under and where the buck stops and, you know, Labour have not hesitated to try and point the finger that it's not really focusing on how it can bring this to as swift a resolution as possible. Mm. And the worry and concern, some suggestions, that, that this could continue uh, until 2025, Rachel. Well, that's right. I mean, I don't know where else you would point the finger if not at the government. But I think that we have a, we have a problem here with all government-built buildings. So, it's, as you say, it's not just schools, it's hospitals, it's libraries, courts. it's courts. Um, and there's a, there's a double whammy of, uh, cause here uh, when we look at this particular government. So it's not just that it's run down and hasn't rebuilt stock. So when we look at all those public buildings, these are buildings that really should have been rebuilt even before we knew about the crumbly concrete. Um, and then we have, you know, 13 years of austerity when all of these buildings and infrastructure would have been squeezed even more. And then we have a government that just doesn't have its eye on the ball because it's been one, infighting, and two, dealing with Brexit. So these things were known, certainly since 2018 at the very latest. We knew about the crumbly school buildings and therefore could have extrapolated that this would apply to other public buildings. What was the government doing in 2018? It was focusing on Brexit. And so there's a, there's a compound here of all the things that the government didn't do or was busy not doing or had, for ideologically reason, reasons, restricted the funding to, um, that have produced this. And I just think that it's this giant metaphor um, for the failure of government, that we now have these buildings that are literally falling apart and causing all this chaos for parents and, of course, for, for children, who should be front and centre of any government policy. And Annabelle, that does have to be the, the, the question. Why is the, the, the government coming to this so late? I and mean, children are going back to school next week. 
Well, as I say, you know, I think it just, it, it's afraid of the pressure that it knew and the criticism and the fire that it knew that it was going to come under. But clearly it's not acceptable if it knew about this problem, you know, at least weeks ago in this hundred or so schools, then it ought to have dealt with them at the start of the summer, not just days before pupils are due to go back. And, you know, it's those who are going to start their A-level years, their GCSE years, those who are starting secondary school, and of course those who will be going into reception. They're starting school for the first time and parents may not be able to drop them off um, at the school gates. I think Rachel's right that this, you know, it's hard not to see this as symbolic of our uh, crumbling government and its inability to perform the most basic functions. Um, it's something is fundamentally broken here but let's not forget the austerity did end years ago. The government is spending hundreds of billions of pounds a year and employs nearly six million people. Well you know, what are these it's people doing? literally its job to employ those people. That's what public services are about. It doesn't deserve a medal for that. No, but it's getting <laughs> bigger and bigger, and yet the, the marginal gains seem to be getting narrower and narrower. So I, need, I think it, there needs to be some fundamental You're not supposed to gain why it's from schools. To, uh, You're literally its supposed to run that service as the government. <laughs> no, well, no, I mean, I agree. But, I, but as I say, I think that... Uh, everything is so skewed at the moment. Look at the size of the NHS and the amount of day-to-day -day government spending that is going on that. And look at the fact that productivity in the NHS war indeed across the public sector has not recovered to pre-pandemic levels. Something is fundamentally wrong here that needs uh, correcting. Um, but you know, nonetheless, it, it remains the case that you know, the state is clearly unable to perform some of its most fundamental uh, functions. And you Not know, the all state, of us are hoping, the government. Well, the government is unable to perform those functions for ideological reasons. Sure, but I mean, this problem predates and should this perform. government. It no, predates this administration. No, they don't. This problem has been apparent for decades. The red flag was raised in the mid-1990s, but there were concerns around um, this rack Bef long before the last then. time, so the last time governments that have failed uh, to last time Labour was in government, solely it pin this committed on years of Tory to building new schools. Okay. And the government scrapped it. The Conservatives scrapped it the minute it got in. Uh, Rachel and Annabelle, we are going to leave it there for, for the moment, but, but, but just to say that the schools minister, Nick Gibb, is, is saying that the, the total number of buildings affected is, is likely to rise. So it is an ongoing uh, problem. We must think of the, the parents and children that are at the centre of this. We are. Welcome back. You are watching the press preview. Still with me, Rachel Shabby and Annabelle Denham. Uh, welcome back to both of you. Let's have a look at the FT Weekend front page. And this um, seemingly a positive story about the economy. Official statistics have added almost 2% to the size of the UK economy in a surprise move that showed the country recovered much faster from the pandemic than previously reported, Rachel. Yeah. The Office for National Statistics has said that it now has much richer data around those lockdown years when data around um, what businesses were spending and what they were losing was not that easy to come by. Now it is. And so they've revised the figures around the economy upwards, which means that we um, aren't recovering as slowly as was previously thought. Uh, we are ahead of Germany, but still behind France and Italy. Although, um, two caveats, I would imagine that if the Office for National Statistics has revised its stats, maybe those countries would as well. And secondly, how does it feel for people? Do people suddenly feel better? Do we feel richer? Is the cost of living biting less? Are did the bill suddenly gone down? The reality is that for most people, this economy is horrible. Uh, and I'm not really sure what these figures, how these mm. figures impact either way. But Annabelle, on the, on the face of it, and certainly on paper, um, this is a good news story. Yes, it is. I mean, it's quite staggering. Uh, that the ONS have added this 2% to the size of the UK economy and that when the Omicron variant uh, was spreading in Britain, our economy was 0.6% a a larger uh, than pre-pandemic levels rather than 1.2% smaller. So, no, as you say, it does appear to be uh, a positive story, particularly when you put it in an international context. There had been a sense that since the pandemic, the UK had been an outlier, that we had been 
lagging far behind uh, countries that we would uh, view as our, our counterparts, that we would compare ourselves to. Um, but no, it turns out that our economy has grown, um, you know, recovered more quickly than that of Germany. Uh, so there's something to cling on to there. But of course, uh, like Rachel says, and the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt has said, you know, this, this does not mean that our uh, economy has made some remarkable uh, recovery. It does not mean that we've had uh, a soft landing. Inflation is still a very persistent problem and the cost of living crisis okay. still rages on. Annabelle, thank you. And uh, Rachel also.